Welcome to Chapter 13 on Social Psychology. In this chapter, we will review social cognition, behavior, and influence, as well as intergroup relations, close relationships, and the role social psychology plays in health and wellness. Children who are born without fingers or lose limbs through accidents might have to endure teasing and stares. But a group of strangers armed with 3D printers have tried to help these children by creating inexpensive prosthetics. The ways that people have come together to solve problems, interact, and form bonds with one another is the subject of social psychology. Social psychology is the study of how people think about, influence, and relate to other people. Social psychologists typically focus on situational factors that lead to behavior. They are interested in how a person's thoughts, feelings, and behavior are influenced by the actual or imagined presence of others. Social psychology is distinctive in at least two ways, its connection to real life events and its reliance on experimental methods. The emergence of social psychology as a field can be traced back to the years after the U.S. Civil War. The field continues to research issues such as attitudes and racism that were important during that time frame as well as now. The field takes inspiration from real life events and the findings have implications for many aspects of everyday life. Since humans are social creatures, it makes sense to always consider the social context of any psychological process. Social psychologists often use experimental methods to conduct their research. The case of Kitty Genovese prompted researchers to study whether the presence of others would make it less likely that an individual would help a person in distress. Kitty Genovese was murdered in New York City in 1964 at 3 a.m. in a courtyard surrounded by apartment buildings. The initial news report stated that it took 30 minutes for her to be killed and that 38 people witnessed the act and did not call the police. Those reports were later found to be false. However, it spurred this area of research. The bystander effect is the tendency for an individual to observe an emergency and to help less when there are other people present than when they are alone. Research demonstrates that when alone, an observer will help 75% of the time, but when another bystander is present, the likelihood of helping drops to 50%. Two factors may contribute to the bystander effect. Actors may use other people to determine whether to help and diffusion of responsibility may have the effect of draining responsibility among the potential helpers. Social cognition is an area of psychology that examines how people select, interpret, remember, and use social information. Person perception refers to the processes by which we use social stimuli to form impressions of others. People judge others by their looks. The face can tell a lot about someone to a social perceiver. Research suggests that we process information about trustworthiness and dominance conveyed in faces automatically without conscious effort. In terms of physical attractiveness and other perceptual cues, attractive individuals are thought to be better adjusted, socially skilled, friendly, likable, extroverted, and more likely to achieve superior job performance. Research has shown that even three to six month old infants prefer to look at attractive faces versus unattractive ones. In a self-fulfilling prophecy, individuals' expectations cause them to act in ways that serve to make those expectations come true. Thaw and Jacobson in 1968 found that teachers' expectations for students can influence the student's actual performance. First impressions are usually formed when people are putting their best foot forward for those few seconds that form that first impression. That ties into the primacy effect, which is the tendency to attend to and remember what we first learned. When an individual wants to impress someone, they put their best foot forward. So it takes a while to get to know someone and then have more information to form an opinion. However, a number of studies have shown that the immediate impressions can be accurate. Attributions are explanations of the causes of behavior. The attribution theory views individuals as motivated to discover the underlying causes of behavior as part of their effort to make sense of the behavior. Attributions vary along three dimensions, internal external causes, stable unstable causes, and controllable uncontrollable causes. The internal external causes include causes inside and specific to the person or outside of the person. Stable unstable causes are whether an individual perceives the cause of behavior to be relatively enduring or temporary. Controllable uncontrollable causes whether we perceive that an individual has some power over some causes but not others. There are also attributional errors. The person who produces the behavior is known as the actor and the person who offers an explanation is known as the observer. Actors often explain their own behavior in terms of external causes. The fundamental attribution error refers to the tendency of observers to overestimate the importance of internal traits and underestimate the importance of external factors when explaining an actor's behavior. 
fundamental attribution error is not universal. Instead, in cross-cultural studies, it has been found that Westerners tend to attribute causes of behavior to a person's personality in contrast to collectivist cultures who tend to attribute causes of behavior to situations. Heuristics are cognitive shortcuts that allow individuals to make decisions rapidly. The representativeness heuristic is the tendency to make judgments about group membership based on physical appearance or the match between a person and one stereotype of a group. Stereotypes are generalizations about a group's characteristics, though those traits may vary from one individual to the next. Stereotypes are used to simplify the understanding of people by classifying them as belonging to one group or another. Stereotypes can be considered a type of heuristic. The false consensus effect is an overestimation of the degree to which everyone else thinks or acts the way an individual does, and it is the result of the individual using his or her own outlook to predict that of others. One of the most important self-related variables is self-esteem, which is the degree to which individuals have positive or negative attitudes about themselves. A positive illusion is a positive view that an individual has about him or herself that is not necessarily rooted in reality. Most people tend to think of themselves as above average in a variety of positive characteristics. High self-esteem and positive illusions can have protective effects on well-being. A self-serving bias refers to the tendency to take credit for success and to deny responsibility for our failures. Self-objectification refers to the tendency for people to see themselves primarily as an object in the eyes of others. Women have been socialized to think of themselves as objects in the social world. Self-objectification can lead to maladaptive behaviors and feelings. It might also interfere with task performance, especially for women and members of stereotype groups. A stereotype threat is an individual's fast-acting, self-fulfilling fear about being judged on the basis of a negative stereotype about his or her group. The stereotype threat has been shown to have a negative effect on groups that have been negatively stereotyped. In one study, women performed lower than men on math tests, even though they had equally strong math training. Similar research has demonstrated this effect when African American and European American students were asked to check a box indicating their ethnicity before completing the test. The African American students performed lower when they had to indicate their ethnicity than in a control group when they did not. Any individual can be influenced by a stereotype threat regardless of their group membership as it influences motivation, effort, anxiety, and distraction. Presenting a task as a challenge rather than as a threat has been shown to diminish this effect. Social comparison is the process by which individuals evaluate their thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and abilities in relation to other people. Comparing ourselves to other people is one way we come to understand our behavior. This process aids us in building our identity. Upward social comparisons can foster feelings of inadequacy and envy, while downward social comparisons can make us feel more positive. Attitudes are how individuals feel about things. It's their opinions and beliefs. Can attitudes predict behavior? There are many situations where people's attitudes will change their behavior. Some of these attitudes include when people's attitudes are strong, when they show a strong awareness of their attitudes and rehearse and practice them, and when they have a vested interest in an issue. So do you think behavior can predict attitudes? Research has shown that changes in behavior sometimes precede changes in attitudes. Cognitive dissonance occurs when individual psychological discomfort is caused by two inconsistent thoughts. We feel discomfort when what we do and what we say are inconsistent. To reduce discomfort, individuals can either change their attitude or change their actions. Effort justification is one method to reduce dissonance. It means coming up with a rationale for the amount of work associated with the difficult goal. If a great deal of effort is put forth, we tend to increase the value associated with the goal. Effort justification might help to explain the strong group loyalty typically associated with initiation rights for Greek organizations, boot camp, and medical school. The self-perception theory stresses that individuals make inferences about their attitudes by perceiving their behavior. Both cognitive dissonance theory and self-perception theory suggest that behavior can change attitudes. Persuasion occurs when individuals try to change another person's attitudes and often his or her behavior as well. The various elements of persuasion include communicator, medium, target, and message. The communicator or source refers to factors such as trustworthiness, expertise, power, attractiveness, likability, and similarity, which are attributed to the person doing the persuasion. 
The medium refers to how the message is presented, meaning what type of technology is used. The target or audience is also a factor in message persuasiveness. Age and attitude strengths are two characteristics of the audience that can determine whether or not a message will be effective. The persuasiveness of the message can best be explained by the elaboration likelihood model. This model states that if an individual is motivated to pay attention, then the central route of persuasion is most effective as it engages someone thoughtfully with a logical argument. If an individual is not paying attention, then the peripheral route is more effective as it involves non-message factors such as the credibility and attractiveness of the persuader. So what constitutes successful persuasion? An important aspect is the order in which arguments are presented. The foot in the door technique involves making a small request at the beginning to let them listen and comply and then ask them for something bigger at the end. Another technique is the door in the face. This is when the communicator makes a bigger request at the beginning, which listeners will probably reject, and then they make a smaller concessionary demand at the end. So how do we resist persuasion? Inoculation, giving people weaker arguments, allows people to resist persuasive techniques. Prior warning about persuasive appeals is also helpful in resisting them. We behave in social ways towards people around us. Two extremes of human social activity are altruism, and aggression. Altruism is prosocial behavior. Prosocial behavior refers to behavior that involves helping another person. Being altruistic means giving to another person with the ultimate goal of benefiting that person, even if it incurs a cost to yourself. Egoism means helping another person for personal gain. Kindness might serve selfish purposes by ensuring reciprocity, meaning that help is given to increase the chances that a person will return the favor. Researchers debate whether altruism is adaptive. How can a behavior that rewards others and not oneself be adaptive? Evolutionary psychologists argue that helping behavior is most likely to occur among family members, thus promoting the family genes to survive. Prosocial behavior is strongly linked to feelings of pleasure. Ethologists have found that altruistic acts of kindness also occur in non-human animals. There are also biological factors in prosocial behavior. Research has shown that genetics do play a role in prosocial behavior. These genetic factors are related to neurotransmitters in the brain. Serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin are all associated with enhanced prosocial behavior. Areas of the midbrain associated with the perception of pain are likely to be active when we feel compassion for another person. There are also psychological factors in prosocial behavior. Empathy, personality, and mood play a role in prosocial behavior. Empathy occurs when an individual feels a oneness with the emotional state of another. The individual truly feels what the other person is feeling and going through because he or she has been there. Agreeableness is the personality trait most strongly associated with prosocial behaviors. Happy people are more likely to help others. People who are in a bad mood may also help if they think it might boost their mood. There are also sociocultural factors in terms of prosocial behavior. One is socioeconomic status. Those of lower socioeconomic status tend to be more likely to help others. Media also plays a role. Media influences have been listed as contributing to aggression, but new research shows that seeing media influences the prosocial behaviors. Music, video games, and television shows with prosocial content have been shown to promote prosocial behaviors in people engaging with those media forms. Aggression refers to social behavior with the objective of harming someone, either physically or verbally. Ethologists note aggression in non-human animals, but most hostile encounters do not escalate to killing or even severe harm. A basic theme of theory is survival of the fittest. Therefore, the survivors are probably aggressive. There are also biological influences in aggression. Genes play a role. It has been shown that there can be an aggressive strain of animals that emerge due to breeding. This, however, has been more difficult to demonstrate in humans. In terms of neurobiological factors, the limbic system and frontal lobes play a role. The limbic system and frontal lobes are two areas of the brain that have been implicated in aggression. Low levels of the neurotransmitter serotonin have also been associated with aggressive behavior. The link between the hormone testosterone and aggression in humans appears to be complex. In terms of psychological influences, personality, as well as low levels of agreeableness are associated with more aggressive behavior. Low levels of conscientiousness and high levels of neuroticism are also associated with more aggressive behavior. The frustration-aggression hypothesis states that frustration always leads to aggression. Research has shown that physical pain, personal insults, and unpleasant events also cause aggression. 
Research has shown that just the presence of a weapon can prime hostile thoughts and produce aggression. The tendency for the presence of a firearm to enhance aggression is known as the weapons effect. One of the strongest predictors of aggression is witnessing aggression in one's own family. Some psychologists believe that aggression is learned through reinforcement and observational learning. There are also sociocultural influences. There is such a thing as the culture of honor. Insult to one's honor is seen as diminishing to one's reputation, and violence is often viewed as an acceptable way of compensating for that loss. Some cultures have been known to slay a female family member that has been raped so that the family is not contaminated by the rape. The media also plays a role. Many researchers have shown that TV violence can prompt aggressive or antisocial behavior in children. Television violence is not the only cause of violence in children. The link between television violence and aggression in children is influenced by a child's aggressive tendencies and the attitudes towards violence. Violent pornography is another type of media violence. Violent pornography refers to films, videos, and magazines that portray the degradation of women in its sexual context. Sexual violence toward women is the result of multiple factors. Violent pornography reinforces the rape myth, the false belief that women desire coercive sex. Violent video games are yet another form of media that may influence aggressive behavior. A meta-analysis concluded that children and adolescents who play violent video games extensively are more aggressive, less sensitive to real-life violence, and more likely to engage in delinquent acts. Some critics debate whether the results found in the laboratory are generalizable to the real-world violence. They also question whether the research takes into account other important variables such as family violence. Conformity is when a person's behavior coincides more closely with a group standard. Conformity is a powerful social source. It can increase group cohesion or it can also be destructive. One example of conformity is the Ashes experiment. In this experiment, a participant was brought into a room with five other people and shown two cards. One with a single vertical line on it and the other with three vertical lines of varying length. The participants were asked to identify which of the lines on the second card was the same length as the line on the first card. The other five people in the room were confederates, meaning that they were working with the experiment, but the volunteer participant didn't know that. The confederates chose the wrong line. The participant had the dilemma of either agreeing with everyone else or stating the obviously correct answer. Ash found that the participants agreed with the confederates incorrectly 35% of the time in giving that wrong answer. There are also biological factors to look at in conformity. FMRI showed that the brain does in fact respond to judgments that differ from the group's judgments as if they were mistakes. The nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area, which are reward centers in the brain, become less activated in women where their ratings differed from group ratings. Oxytocin has been implicated in producing individual preferences that match the members of the group. There are also psychological factors involved. The informational social influence refers to the influence that other people have on individuals because the individual wants to be right. Informational social influence depends on how confident we are in our own judgment and how well informed we perceive the group to be. The normative social influence refers to the influence that others have on an individual because the individual wants others to like them or to approve of them. You also have to look at cultural factors. Collectivist cultures have been associated with greater levels of conformity. Obedience is a behavior that complies with the explicit demands of the individual in authority. In Stanley Milgram's classic experiment, Volunteer participants, who were teachers, were asked to deliver dangerous and painful electric shocks to other participants, who were the learners. The other participants were confederates, but the volunteer participants who were playing the teachers did not know this. Almost two-thirds of the volunteer participants delivered the full 450 volts of electric shocks to the other participants, even though they were acting as if it was hurting them or going to kill them. It is unlikely that Milgram's experiment would be approved using our current ethical guidelines. Stanford Prison Experiment is another controversial demonstration of the power of obedience. Conducted by Philip Zimbardo in 1971, where he created a simulated prison and subjects were divided into the role of prisoner or guard. Guards were informed that they would be taking away each prisoner's individuality. Due to concerns about the subject's safety, the experiment ended only after six days rather than the two weeks it was planned. Zimbardo concluded that situational factors powerfully affect human behavior. Good people will do evil things to other good people if the situation supports those deeds. Zimbardo argued that guards and prisoners behaved according to their assigned roles because the environment supported the behavior. Exerting personal control also plays a role. Not everyone goes along with social influence. 
A relationship with the social world is reciprocal. When people believe that they have control over their own actions, they are less likely to conform. Reactance refers to the motivation to reject attempts to control us. It occurs when a person feels that someone or something is taking away his or her choices. Group influence also plays a role, and so does de-individuation. De-individuation occurs when being part of a group reduces personal identity and erodes the sense of personal responsibility. One explanation for de-individuation is that groups give individuals anonymity. An individual may do something in a group that he or she would never do when alone. For example, cyberbullying is highest when people feel they are anonymous. Social contagion is also a factor. Social contagion is imitative behavior that involves the spreading of behavior, emotions, or ideas. For example, people laugh more when others are laughing. Group performance is also a factor. Some research has shown that performance is better when there is more than one individual, while other studies conclude that we are more productive when we work alone. But think about running a race. People often do better when they have someone to compete against versus running it alone. Social facilitation occurs when an individual's performance improves because of the presence of others. The presence of others arouses individuals and that arousal produces energy. Social facilitation improves our performance on well-learned tasks. If arousal is too high, the presence of others might undermine our performance. Social loafing occurs when an individual exerts less effort when in a group because the individual feels less accountable for his or her individual effort. When there is social loafing, there's a lower group performance. With a larger group, the individual feels as though he or she can loaf without detection from others in the group. Social loafing can be reduced by making members accountable for their individual contributions and by making the group's task more attractive. Group decision making and risky shift in group polarization are issues you need to be aware of. The risky shift occurs when there's a tendency for a group decision to be riskier than the average decision made by an individual in the group. Group polarization is the solidification and further strengthening of a position as a consequence of a group discussion. Groupthink can be dangerous. Groupthink refers to a group's impaired decision making and avoidance of realistic appraisal in order to maintain group harmony. Instead of rocking the boat, group members place the highest value on conformity and unanimity. Some recent examples of groupthink are the Challenger Crisis, the days leading up to the war in Iraq, and unresponsiveness of officials to allegations that former assistance football coach Jerry Sandusky engaged in many acts of child abuse. Groupthink can be reduced if groups avoid isolation, encourage dissent, and have an impartial leader who allows debate. There's also the influence of the majority and minority groups. Most groups make decisions by voting and usually the majority wins. The majority exerts its influence through both information influence and normative influence. The minority must exert its pressure through informational pressure. If the minority makes its point consistently and confidently, the majority is more likely to listen. Intergroup relations refers to conflicts between groups, especially ethnic and cultural groups which are rampant around the world right now. The terrorist organization ISIS attacks Paris and Brussels and the wrong nations retaliate. Israelis and Palestinians fight over territory in the Middle East and African tribes try to craft a new and social order favorable to their own rule. A variety of concepts introduced by social psychologists can help us understand the intensity of conflicts between groups and provide insight in how to reduce them. Think about how you describe yourself. When someone asks you to describe yourself, do you often respond with groups that you belong to? How much does it matter whether the people you associate with are members of the same group? Our social identity plays a role. Social identity refers to the way individuals define themselves in terms of their group membership. K. Doe identified five types of social identity including ethnicity and religion, personal relationship, vocations and avocations, political affiliations, and stigmatized groups. The social identity theory states that individual social identity is a crucial part of their self-image and a valuable source of positive feelings about themselves. In order for individuals to feel good about themselves, they need to feel good about the group to which they belong. An in-group is the group to which the individual belongs. The out-group is the other group in which they don't belong. Research suggests that we continually compare our in-groups with out-groups to improve our self-image. Ethnocentrism is the tendency to favor one's own ethnic group over other groups. It involves asserting superiority over outgroups. Being prejudiced is having an unjustified negative attitude toward an individual based on the individual's membership in a group. Prejudice can take place in many forms such as age, sex, race, 
religion, or nationality. Prejudice is a worldwide phenomenon. For example, in the Balkan Peninsula of Eastern Europe, the Serbs' prejudice against the Bosnians prompted the Serb policy of ethnic cleansing. The prejudice of the Hutus against the Tutsis in Rwanda led them to go on a murderous rampage, attacking the Tutsis with machetes. From satellite imaging, the mounds of bodies of the dead could be seen. An individual's views about race relations depends on that individual's own race and their experience. Explicit racism refers to a person's conscious and openly shared attitude, while implicit racism refers to the attitudes that exist on a deeper hidden level. Both forms of racism can influence behavior. The following reasons can be possible answers to why people develop prejudice. Competition between groups over scarce resources. Motivation to enhance self-esteem. Cognitive processes that contribute to a tendency to categorize and stereotype others, and cultural learning. A stereotype is a generalization about a group. Stereotypes may lead to prejudice when they contain negative information. The use of heuristics as an aspect of cognitive processing might allow individuals to rely on stereotypes in judging others, and in that sense be more prejudiced. Discrimination is an unjustified negative or harmful action toward a member of a group just because the individual belongs to that group. There are things that can be done to improve inter-ethnic relations. Contact alone has not been found effective. There are things that work best. If groups think they are of equal status, feels an authority figure approves positive relations. If they anticipate emergent friendship, they engage in cooperative tasks. Aronson's jigsaw classroom involves creating groups that are equal in ethnic composition and academic level. Each person in the group is given a part that they are responsible for in a project. All parts are needed to complete the project. Research has shown that such assignments improved inter-ethnic perceptions, friendship, self-esteem, and academic performance. In the Sheriff's 1961 Robbers Cave study, you can see the graph where it shows negative feelings that were expressed by members of the Eagles and the Rattlers teams towards each other after a competitive tournament and then after a cooperative activity. As you can see, the expression of negative feelings decrease after they worked cooperatively together. One possible way to live in a world without prejudice or discrimination is to get to know individuals so that they might be able to get along. The power of task-oriented cooperation and reducing tensions between groups was demonstrated in the Sheriff's and Aronson's research. In the Sheriff's Robbers Cave study, it involved assigning boys to two competitive camps in Robbers Cave, Oklahoma. By the end of the first week, both camps knew of the other, and the we and they talk started. To With each competitive event, the team saw the other team as competing unfairly. Sheriff tried to get the two teams to have non-competitive contact, but that didn't work. The only thing that worked in getting the two teams to work together was to have them cooperatively solve a problem. Research suggests that interventions can reduce implicit bias and raise awareness about the problems of discrimination. Along with good health and happiness, close relationships are prominent in most notions of a good life. Proximity is a good predictor of attraction. The mere exposure effect states that the more individuals come in contact with something, the more likely they are to start liking. Individuals like to associate with people who are similar to themselves. Consensual validation is explained when an individual's attitudes and behavior are supported and when another individual's attitudes and behavior are similar. Romantic love, also called passionate love, has strong components of sexuality and infatuation and it often predominates in the early part of a relationship. Affectionate love, also called compassionate love, is the type of love that occurs when one has a desire to have a person near to them and they have a deep, caring affection for that person. The social exchange theory is based on the notion of an exchange of goods. The objective is to minimize cost and maximize benefits. Early in a relationship, equity is a good predictor of satisfaction. Happily married couples are less likely to think about the cost and the benefits of their relationship. The investment model examines the ways that commitment, investment, and the availability of attractive alternative partners predict satisfaction and stability in relationships. Long-term relationships are more likely to continue when both partners are committed and invested in the relationship and when there are less attractive alternatives around. Social ties have been shown to be one of the most important variables in predicting physical health. 
Individuals who participate in diverse social networks tend to live longer than those with a narrow social network. Some of the strategies for becoming better connected with others are to participate in activities that can be done with others, be aware of the early warning signs of loneliness, engage in positive behaviors when meeting new people, and see a counselor or read a book on loneliness. So a review of the chapter. We looked at the investigation of the features of social psychology. You should be able to describe how people think about the social world. Describe social behavior, particularly altruism and aggression. Identify how people are influenced in social settings. Discuss intergroup relations. Explain the nature of close relationships. And describe social processes affecting health and wellness.